25th. Well, we're going to continue, our, we're actually going to pick up now our new uh, Advent series. As you, as you might expect, we're in December now, so we're going to be uh, joining in with this whole celebration and looking forward to Christmas. And today we're going to be looking at the subject, as is the candle's tradition, of peace. The second candle is the candle of peace, and we're going to be looking at that this morning. To help us to dig into this, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 35. Uh, read along with me. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. Amen. Well, the reason why I chose this passage is because it's not really all that familiar to us. This isn't one of those passages that you often pull out when you're going to read the Christmas story with your kids. And so uh, we pull it out today because it does give us an unusual take, an unusual look at this whole Christmas theme, especially the theme of peace. You see, Christmas every year has a message that people listen to. We read the story, we sing about it, we sing Christmas carols today, but we don't really think deeply about it. You see, there's a message behind the carols, there's a message behind the hymns, and it's in the Christmas text, and yet, maybe this is your experience, it has become so bland that we just sort of passively listen to it all, and it just kind of washes over us without really a thought about what it all means. Let me give you an example of how this actually goes with a real-time explanation of it. Every year, Handel's Messiah is performed, and it's going to be performed all over this state this year. It'll be performed down at the Denver Philharmonic. It'll be performed up in Fort Collins. It'll be performed probably in Durango, for all I know. It'll be performed in very good productions, and it'll be performed in meh. And I've been in both of those as a performer. On the positive side of the ledger of that, just to hear the Messiah performed in so many different ways, in so many different venues, proves that it is a masterwork. And it is. It proves to us that it is an enduring masterwork. We're willing to sit through it year in and year out. And if you haven't heard Handel's Messiah, I would entreat you, go especially to a well-done version of it. Go and hear it because it lifts the soul. It is a powerful work no matter who and how it is being performed. But on the other hand, for those of us that hear it regularly or have performed it regularly, we've gotten so used to it, we've sort of lost the meaning of what it really is is all about. We've lost sight of the elemental principles of the great hallelujah chorus itself. Did you know that the chorus originates from Revelation 19? In Revelation 19, the true Messiah, it turns out, wears a linen cloth drenched in blood. This is a Christmas theme? He has the word Lord of Lords written on his thigh. He, here comes this figure in Revelation 19 in heaven, and he's wearing blood-drenched clothes. He's on a horse. He's bearing a sword. He's coming in as a conquering victor. And he says, I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
But we're hearing hallelujah arias piled on top of each other and saying to ourselves, how beautiful. What a beautiful work of art. And it is. And maybe we've heard the hallelujah chorus so many times, so often, that we don't really think about what it means for the world as a whole and what it means for us. We think we know what it's all about, and so we don't see conflict, and you may have noted that I put conflict intentionally into the title, as one of the central messages of Christmas, but it is. This text this morning brings out this seldom seen, seldom articulated, very, very, very seldomly expanded upon theme of Christmas. Here in this particular text, we see it. It comes out so clearly with what Simeon tells to Mary that we can't ignore it. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So this is what we need to understand about the advent of Jesus Christ. It says he came. Yes, he came as an infant. To quote Ricky Bobby, a little baby, tiny infant, baby Jesus. We love him, right? But he came to bring about a cataclysmic change to the structures of this world. That's why he came. The way things are done, the way things are thought about, the way we live life out is about to change radically. And therefore, Christmas is really a celebration of the day that God chose to pick a fight. That's really what it's about. You know, Jesus coming on the scene is God picking a fight. You're wondering, wait, 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 wait. whoa, slow down. I thought you said it was about the candle of peace. Isn't Christmas all about peace? I mean, isn't that what the angels said? Peace on earth, goodwill to men, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace. Didn't he say that? I mean, isn't that that part of scripture too? Yeah, yeah, it is. Well done, you remembered. That's good. Of course, he comes to bring peace on earth. He does that. But notice there in Simeon's prophecy, he says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Simeon was living a life of faith on earth with very little to prove that his faith was well-founded up until that point. He just had to go on God's word that God had promised him he would see the Messiah before he died. But Jesus' coming means he's about to die. Wait a second, what's the peace in all of this? Ah, but he's a man of faith. Faith and peace come together. So Jesus coming and being revealed to Simeon brought peace to his life. He was no longer in conflict. He was no longer in turmoil as he lived his life counter, contra, to the practices of the day, to the attitudes of his culture around him. He was living completely differently. You see, Jesus brings peace on earth through conflict. How did the Allies bring peace to German-occupied Normandy. They invaded on D-Day. They invaded France. That's how they brought peace to France. How does a surgeon bring peace to a cancer patient's body? He invades it through surgery, and then he poisons it to eradicate the cancer. You see, chemotherapy is an invasion to bring peace to your body physically. So look at what Simeon says in verse 34 about the conflict that Jesus brings. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. You see, Jesus brings peace on earth, which comes about through his appointed sign, which is opposed. We'll get to that in a little bit. But what's the sign? In Matthew chapter 12, the scribes and Pharisees wanted to test Jesus, and they were asking him for a sign. Give us a sign to show us that you're really the Messiah, and look at how he responds. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You see, the sign is, I'm going to die. That's the sign I'm going to give to you. I'm going to be swallowed up. I'm going to be out of fellowship with you for three days. And this is starting to sound like a Good Friday and Easter Sunday meditation, but it's not. It's a Christmas meditation. 
Here's Simeon's Christmas prophecy. He says there in verse 34 that the sign is going to be opposed. So you have to ask yourself, if the sign is death for three days, why would there be opposition to it? Good question. Because it, the sign, will bring about a chain of events by which Jesus will be installed as Revelation 19 proclaims, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Of course, it is through opposition of that sign that the sign itself comes about. And it comes about that it will pierce Mary's soul in the process. But in doing so, it will bring peace to Mary's life. This is the message of Christmas. Jesus came to bring about a change that will pierce souls and reveal hearts. But it only comes through conflict that arises out of his very presence. Conflict comes because he comes. But he's the instigator of that conflict. He's the one who changes the status quo. I would love to paint him as the one who swung second, but he doesn't. He picks the fight. Jesus himself even says so. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. What kind of Christmas sermon is this? What he's saying is that the only way he can accomplish the peace that he will bring is to cause division. That seems all wrong. This is upside down from our sensibilities, isn't it? But this text teaches that Jesus comes as the great divider. He does. He comes intentionally as an invader, creating new conflicts. Why? Because creation needs to be renovated. All of creation needs to be renovated. If you've ever done a renovation project, you know that the first thing that you have to do in a renovation project is you have to tear out all the bad stuff. Right? All that stuff that's not savable in the area that you're renovating has to go. So you cut it out. You, you blast it away. Whatever you have to do, you crush whatever it is that needs to be renovating. And then the space is open and available for you to begin the new work. So this is why the Advent is so important. It represents the culmination of God's work as he was restoring creation. And it needs a complete restoration. Look at what Ephesians 2 says about us and our world. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We might uh, approach this issue of conflict and sword as though, well, this seems really unfair. Jesus would pick on us this way. But when we add the idea of Ephesians 2, what is proclaimed there, that we're in thrall to a principality of the air that is controlling our lives, suddenly this whole idea of Jesus bringing a sword doesn't seem so bad. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. Do you see it? There's this illegitimate power that is in control of the world. And we've gotten used to it as humans. People are walking in the course of this world following a prince that desires, first and foremost, above all, disobedience to the true God of this world, to the true God of everything. So Jesus talks about confronting that power in his restorative work in John chapter 12, verse 31. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So I ask the question, is Jesus bringing the sword into that storyline a good thing? Well, I don't know. Depends on your perspective, I suppose. If you're an Egyptian, God getting involved in his people's lives is not so good. But if you're an Israelite, it's the most glorious thing that ever happened to you until you get out into the wilderness and suddenly realize you're starving to death. And then you're going, I wish I could go back to Egypt, right? Right? Is it a good thing that he comes into the storyline bearing a sword? Yes, I think it is. And I think you'd have to say yes. Because this world is in darkness and pain and misery and death. And Jesus comes to bring light and life to it. 
So back to Luke chapter 2, verse 34. Behold, this child is appointed for the rise, or fall and rising of many in Israel, for a sign that is opposed. Simeon is saying Jesus Christ's coming causes polarization. The rising and fall of many. Some will rise, some will fall. He's coming causes that. Jesus' appearance is responsible for both because he is divisive. Simeon predicts it, and the Bible talks about it. Luke chapter 12, do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? (laughs) This is Jesus talking, not Matt. No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now, we might be able to grasp the why of that, right? If some people are going to follow the prince of darkness, then yes, there's going to be conflict when light comes. We might be able to grasp the right, the, the why of it. But it's really what we need to ask in this cosmic battle that we cannot see is how? How does he do it? How does Jesus create this conflict? How does Jesus cause both the rising and the falling? How does he polarize people in this way? And the answer is Jesus himself. He combined both an overwhelming repulsiveness to his claims and the overwhelming attractiveness of his life. The overwhelming repulsiveness of his claims and the overwhelming attractiveness of his life. If you see and understand both of those things, then you'll see how he causes people to either rise or fall, but nobody is left alone. Not one person is left alone. He leaves no room for anybody to stay in the middle, to not make a choice, although many have tried throughout the years. First, there's this overwhelming attractiveness of his life. And we've talked about the fact that the Gospel of Mark, in, the, in past sessions, we've talked about how the Gospel of Mark is really about the facts of Jesus' life. It's event, 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 right? Matthew, Luke, John, they have all of Jesus' teachings there. But in the Gospel of Mark, it's not so much about his teachings, more about his life that's in view. And so Mark is all over this idea about wherever Jesus went, the big question was, who is this? You know, look at after he calms the storm in Mark chapter 4, verse 41, they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They were trying to figure out who he was, and you see this throughout Mark. They were trying to figure out who he was, because his life was forcing a decision. He commanded wind and waves, yet he ate with sinners and tax collectors. Who does this person think he is? They were not saying, what does he teach? Does he teach things that make me feel good? Then I'll follow him. They were saying, who is he? The overwhelming attractiveness of his life makes me want to be near him because even though he heals and even though he controls wind and waves, he still eats with sinners and tax collectors. Who is this man? But when you do look at his teaching, well, then, then Jesus starts pushing all of your buttons. You see, what we want is a Jesus that while he has power, he also agrees with me about what I want. But Jesus doesn't do that, does he? He's relentless. He says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Wait, 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 wait. I thought that's all I had to do. He says, no, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On judgment day, whether you go to heaven or hell, all depends on whether or not you know and love me. It's not enough to just say, yeah, yeah, I agree you're out there somewhere. That's not it. He's not mincing words either as he teaches this. He's proclaiming a whole new order. He says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. He's saying, I have the power over all of eternity, and you need to believe in me, and if you don't, you're going to be condemned. He even, can be, be, he even claimed to be the arbiter of truth. Can you imagine? Would anybody be so bold in today's society to say, I have the truth, the absolute truth, and nothing but the truth, and if you don't follow me, you ain't in it? Well, he does. 
Look at John chapter 18, verse 37, when Pilate said to him, so you are a king, Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. You see, there's no way that you can stay neutral when someone comes to you and says, this is the truth. If you don't like me, you don't like the truth. You can't stay neutral on that. You either have to reject that person, you have to fight them off, or you have to comply and submit. He says, I am so important that if your eye or your hand keeps you away from me, then you need to cut off your hand and pluck out your eye. That's what he says. He says, you need to eat my body and drink my blood to have life. Woo, that drove a lot of people away. If you have me, you have life. If you don't have me, you will be like the chaff on the wind, is what he says. I could go on and on about what Jesus claims and what he teaches. You can't get away from it. He demands allegiance. And that's the reason why Simeon said he will be a sign that will be spoken against. Because he demanded people make a choice. You either have to align yourself with him or you have to allow and allow him to raise you or you have to fall. You will either find he repulses you or else you embrace him completely. That's what you get when you actually look at his teachings. The reason Jesus polarized people was not simply because he claimed to be God. Lots of people claim to be God. Most of them live in padded rooms, but also because of the overwhelming attractiveness of his life, how he lived matched what he said. Nobody, but nobody who claims the things he claims and demands adoration continually and is always talking about himself, (laughs) and make no mistake, he was always talking about himself, nobody combines that with a life that is as humble as his life was, as compassionate and tender and full of wisdom as his life was. There's never been anybody like that who could combine both that level of humility and that level of audacity. You have lots of humble, compassionate, tender people out there, and they're really attractive. They would never say the things about themselves that Jesus says about himself. Humble, attractive people don't do that. They would never sound like Donald Trump. Even on Donald Trump's worst day, they would never do that. But Jesus does. So people tell me, people tell me, everyone who's on the side of truth listens to my voice. That's what they say. I don't say that. They say that. Right? That sounds like Donald Trump, doesn't it? But that's what Jesus says. People who are on the side of, of truth listen to me because I am truth. People would rather just believe Jesus was a nice guy. He was, but not just a nice guy. They would rather say, oh, well, maybe he was just a really good teacher, and that's why everybody remembers him still. That's not, a, even, a, that's not even a logical statement. When you look at his t- teachings, and you look at his statements, that's not even available to you. Good teacher? No. And the reason why they do that, they make those claims, is because of what they really want is they want to be mildly religious. They don't want to have to decide if they believe that he is the Savior. They don't want to have to decide whether or not he is the God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. They don't want to have to make that decision. Because to confront that means that they either have to accept it Or they have to speak against it and decide that he's an absolute sham, an absolute lunatic, an absolute liar. Because that's all that's available to us, as C.S. Lewis so famously stated. He's either Lord, or he's a lunatic, or he's a liar. Most people don't want to have to choose. They just want to be sort of a Christian. You know, I mean, kind of moral, you know, kind of religious. I don't know how many Sundays a year that would be, but, you know, we'll figure it out. But that's not open to us. If we look at his teachings, if we look at his lifestyle, Jesus causes conflicts between people, and he polarizes people, and he divides people. Why? Because he's in the midst of renovating this world. Jesus causes conflict also within the heart. 
Not just interpersonally, but internally he's causing conflict. And there are people today who desperately try to find an intellectual way to stay away from having either to, to rise or to fall. Can't I just stay on an even keel? Do I have to really accept him? Do I have to reject him? Do I have to do that? They're desperately seeking to stay away from either rejecting him or accepting him. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 1. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Now, there's a whole litany of bad things that happened to them after that. But this is the entry into the whole subject. They knew God. They had his revelation in their lives. Whether it's just the the revelation of creation or their conscience, or they actually have the Word of God. They have the revelation of Him in their lives. And so Jesus forces a decision for them. And He does so because of His claims. Because of the attractiveness of His life, He introduces a new decision into the equation. Now there's a new way. There's a better way to know God. You thought the only way is if you could live absolutely perfectly, then you could know God. And, and God says, you know what, I'm going to do away with that because that's keeping a lot of you from me. Instead, I'm going to give you grace. And you can still know me. And you can know me intimately, even better than you knew me before. And people will still reject him. Simeon says so. The thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Look at that statement. The, the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Do you, do you realize that the advent of Jesus Christ first and foremost reveals the heart of God? He's the first and foremost the heart that is revealed in the advent. His love is revealed as he puts finality and absolute definition on the statement that he loves his creation, that he loves people. The coming of Jesus as a baby reveals the thoughts of his heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But God shows his love. He demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's heart is revealed. How do you deny that? But that's just one of many hearts. God loves you. What's your response? What's your response to his heart being open to you? Do you love him back? Do you love God or are your loyalties directed to other pursuits? Have you been listening to the principalities of the air whose main purpose and goal and desire in your life is to get you only thinking about yourself? That's the truth of it. Your heart will be revealed in your choice. Do you love him or do you love yourself? If you love him, if you stand by him, then your heart will be revealed and your soul will be pierced by what he went through. That's what Simeon tells Mary. Her soul was pierced. It was. Yes, it would be horrendous to watch your son die. It would be horrendous to watch your Savior die. But that's what we do when we stand with him. We say, yes, Lord, I agree that your death was good. And that's a good thing. As we stand with him, our heart is revealed because it pierces our hearts. That's what repentance really is all about. To say, yes, Jesus, your, your death for me was right, and it was good, and I accept it as the only way to you. I can't do it on my own. It's Christmas, so let's bring up another Christmas story, right? You're like Ebenezer Scrooge before the visit of the spirits, right? You remember Ebenezer Scrooge and the, the people come by to, to get a donation from him, right? They're trying to take donations to try and relieve hunger for the poor, and you've got everything under control, right? You've got Bob Cratchit in the front office that you only allow one lump of coal a day to, and there's no tenderness in your heart for anybody. And when they come to you, you say things like, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? You see, you don't have a sinful heart, although we could say certainly that greed is sinful, but you may not have greed in your heart. You just have a hardened heart. And you need an external power that can come into your life and change you and give you the power to change. And in the process of finding Christ, you repent. You trust him to save you. And you become free of all of your burdens, just like Scrooge was freed after the, the night of Christmas Eve, after the visit of those three spirits. And no, that's none of that's real, obviously. We know that. But he's freed. He wakes up in the morning and he says, I feel as light as a feather. That's what repentance does. 
It feels like it's, it's going to be painful, but after it's done, you're free. Before it's done, you're hard. Nobody can make an impact on you. It's all about you. It doesn't really matter what anybody else does. Afterwards, suddenly you're open to the things of God and you're free. You're adopted into a family and you're treated as if you've accomplished everything he's accomplished. That is a wonder. But the only way to get to that peace is through paying that humbling pain of repentance. Do you see, do, can you see it? Is, it? is it clear that your only hope is through the sheer mercy of God? There is no other way. People squirm, right? When you say that, it's very uncomfortable. You say, I can't fix it myself. But you can't. Nobody can. You see, repentance is an easy word to comprehend, but it is hard to do. Repentance is painful. Repentance is difficult. But it truly is the only way that you can get peace. So it is that choice, the choice to repent of yourself, to hold on or, or to hold on to your illusions. That's the choice. That's the division of your heart. That's what Jesus brings a sword into your life with. I'm going to divide this heart and I'm going to figure out whether or not he stands for me or he stands for himself. By the way, I'm not just talking to people that maybe haven't made that choice for themselves. I'm talking about believers too. He's still revealing your heart day in and day out. He's revealing my heart. Martin Luther said that all of life is repentance. There may be many places where you come as a Christian, you find that you're at a crossroads. Often this direction is a road to comfort, and often that direction is a road to obedience. Which one will you choose? Comfort or obedience? You know, if you obey what the Word of God says, you maybe might lose something, or at least you may not gain something. You might lose some reputation, or you may not gain the reputation that you think you want. It might mean you might lose an opportunity in your life to obedience to Him. When a person becomes a Christian, a new peace comes into your life. Yes, that's true. But at the same time, there's a new fight in your life as well. As you struggle with, am I going to be obedient to God or am I going to go on my own route? Day in and day out, we have to fight that battle of repentance in our lives. This is what discipleship is, coming to a, a newfound agreement every day. God, this is where I know you're leading me and this is where I'm going to follow you. That peace that he promises you doesn't come without conflict in your life, but as you ingrain that habit of following God into every step of your life as you, as you depend on the Word of God to be that light to your feet, that lamp to your path. Maybe I got those reversed. As you, as you follow Him, though, He is that for you. He doesn't extend the light out. He doesn't say, hey, there's the path for miles out in the future. He says, there's the next step. Do you trust me? There's a conflict we have to wage war against the flesh and the devil. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You see, the, the prince of this world makes it look like the road to peace is the road to whatever pleases you. Look, that's the easy route. The one that pleases you, take that one. Look at how easy it is. Look at how great it is. You get all this, whatever you want. But God says, no, this is my world. And because I'm ultimately in charge, the way to obedience is to what I say and who I am. And when you're on that road, you're on the road to ultimate peace. But to get there, you have to do battle. You have to do battle with the, the principalities, the battle between personal relationships, you have to do battle within yourself to those principalities that want to deceive your heart. And as your heart is revealed, then you stand. So, what should we conclude about all of this? What should be our conclusion? And this might sound like toxic masculinity, but I'll take my chances. This is what I think Christmas really should reveal to all of us. Christmas teaches us as Christians not to be crybabies. 
We are not to be crybabies. Why? Because the king has come. He's brought a sword. There's absolutely no reason for us to whine and cry as though, oh, this is just terrible. This is hardship is happening in my life. No. Stop being a crybaby. Simeon says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. You see, Simeon says, hey, I can die now. He's not even afraid of that. There's no crybaby in him. He's like, I've suffered a life. I haven't known peace, but now I know it and I'm ready. There's no crybaby in this. God's light of revelation, his ultimate peace that is brought by this child is what we celebrate at Christmas. It is. But this child is the cause of rising and falling of many. He brings trouble. Get ready for it. It's coming. This isn't much of a Christmas sermon. I'm never coming back. (laughs) He brings it to himself first. You need to understand that. His coming was intentional. Nobody led him to that cross. He directed every step of his life to bring himself to that cross. He went to that cross out of his love for you and me. And people opposed him to his face. Therefore, we should not be shocked when there's opposition to us when we love God. So don't be a crybaby about it. Get ready, it's coming. I'm going to call up our worship team as we close this out this morning. Sure, we're distressed. There's a lot in our world that can give us angst, cause anger in us. We may be surprised by some of the issues that we never dreamed of 20 years ago coming up and being an issue today. Maybe we feel that we're oppressed, but we have hope. You see, Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah in his very first sermon in Nazareth. He quotes it here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus wrapped up that sermon that day by saying to that synagogue, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. (laughs) The year of the Lord's favor is at hand. There's liberty, there's peace, there's grace, there's joy, there's hope available. Because there is glory. Where did Simeon get his peace? He says, now I have peace because my eyes have seen your salvation. If we have seen his salvation, we look forward with nothing but hopeful expectation. That's where our peace comes from is his hopeful salvation. What he's going to do and he's going to return in linen bathed in blood. And everybody's going to sing hallelujah. He came poor. He humbled himself to the point of death so that he and we could be exalted together. So that those who humble themselves will be exalted. Don't shrink back from that. May we never shrink back from what he has called us to. Don't be a crybaby. Take your stand with him. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Will you stand with me as we close in prayer this morning? Lord Jesus, may the Christmas season remind us of the boldness that you had, the audacity that you had to invade the world as a baby. We're also reminded later as the the disciples attempted to defend your life, you said, I could call down all my legions right now and none of this would happen. So Lord, we know that you came for an express purpose. You came to invade a world that is given over to death, to bring life and light. If there's anyone in this room that has not embraced that 
truth. Lord, I pray that you would reveal them in their heart today that you are life and that you are light, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, that if we surrender to you, that you give yourself wholly to us and we are holy in you. Lord, we pray that we would live that out as we go from this place. May we not shrink back. May we boldly take ground because you have already invaded the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.